And while you're turning to the book of Acts, let me please give a couple of uh, added notes here. First of all, I need to uh, get the books or the CDs to the ladies who decorated the tables for the Father's Day Fellowship and also to the men uh, from the Father's Day that uh, didn't get uh, their uh, gift for whatever it was that they were supposed to get it for. And I have those books in now from Elmer Dill, Out of the Mouth of the Lion. So you guys, if you will come to me, or I think Marcia knows where they are, or Brother Justin knows where they are, uh, you can get your book. Again, that's the ladies who decorated tables for the um, Father's Day Fellowship, one to a family, you understand. And then also the uh, fellows from Father's Day who needed that. And I wanted to make mention of the report for last week. Uh, two professions of faith, 144 in Sunday school, 170 in the morning church service, and 143 last Sunday night, which was a banner crowd. I praise the Lord for it. The offering totaled 38.37.64, of which 34.06.84 was regular, 234.50 missions, 105 building, and a couple of other things as well. I praise the Lord for the good offerings during the month of uh, June, and I trust that you will rejoice in the Lord with me for the way He has blessed our church. Uh, in a wonderful way financially and I've been praising the Lord for his blessings upon us and other ways likewise here of late. Now in the book of Acts we've been in chapter number 19 and uh, in Acts chapter number 19 you can't hear me? You can't hear me? Well, all I know to say is, is that the green light is on. And the mic is up here. And all I know to say is that's the way it is. Um, I feel like I'm not to blame. <laughs> Am I coming through at all? It's still not on. What in the world is going on? Oh, well, that's okay. I'll try to use this one then. Unless uh, Dave can get back there. I thought Justin was back there. What happened? To... Oh, there's Justin over there now. He's sitting by his wife tonight. Anyway, if, if you guys can figure this out, it'd be a good thing because I don't like to always stay behind the pulpit. And if I get out there, I don't want anybody to go to sleep um, on me. Anyway, in Acts chapter 19, please. We are studying about the Apostle Paul's third missionary journey. And you guys will recall that I had been in that 20, 32nd verse, going back to it after finishing up the chapter, and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. And I took that as a typical example of mob gatherings and mob rule, but yet I applied it also to the people that come to church. What are we here for anyway? Why have we come? I think a person needs to have purpose when they come to Jesus Christ's church. And I think it's important for us to know why we're here. And I tried to go through some various things, and you may recall that in going through those things, I wound up last Wednesday night with the thought, please, that we ought to be here for evangelism. The coming of lost souls to Jesus Christ ought to be of importance to us. And I believe that it is good for us to understand that indeed we need a heart with a burden to reach the lost for Jesus Christ. Because indeed, folks, the Bible still teaches there's a heaven and there is a hell and the saved go to heaven and the lost have to spend eternity in hell. The Bible teaches us that it is certainly 
our part as those who know Jesus Christ as Savior to be witnesses for the Lord, right? I mean, Acts 1.8, Ye shall be witnesses unto me. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, ye shall receive power. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. I believe that it's important for us to understand who know the Lord and Savior, that we are to be evangels for the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You can take that as an evangel, you can take it as an evangelist, you can take it as a witness, you can take it as an ambassador from 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, uh, verse number 20 and verse number 21. That was not a loose screw in my head, by the way. In case anybody questions that, that is, that, that is not me. Uh, but I um, want to get back to the point. It is right, folks, that God's people have a burden for the lost. Uh, if you don't, I believe that one of the very first things to do is to pray and ask God to give you a burden for the lost. And one thing that's going to be useful and needful, indispensable in trying to reach the lost for Jesus Christ is to see to it that we have a love for people. Now, loving people is sometimes hard. I don't know about you guys, but I know a lot of good dogs that it's easier for me to love than a lot of people. That's sad, isn't it? But it, I bet, am I on yet? Is this thing working yet? Is it working? It's working now? I'm on? Okay. Uh, now that I, can, I don't have to stay back there then, I guess. I, I want to say this, that uh, uh, I know a lot of good dogs that people can take lessons from and get some personality traits from. Of course, they snarl a little bit too, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But I'll tell you one thing, a lot of dogs are more loyal to their masters than Christians are to their masters. Amen. And that's a crying shame. And, uh, you know, one thing I like about dogs is they wag their tail more than their tongue. And maybe that's why they're more likable than a lot of people are. But still, the point of it is, uh, I think one reason why we uh, have a tendency to like dogs or love dogs is, uh, you know, uh, a dog will come up to you in many cases, and I don't like the breeds of dogs that are mean-spirited, I don't like the breeds of man that are being spirited either. Uh, but I, I think a dog will come up to you wagging its tail and you know a dog will be faithful and loyal and, and a dog will love you in spite of yourself. I think that we need to learn to love people in spite of themselves many, many ways. And many of us do not have the real love for people that I think that we really ought to have. We need to first of all have love for God. Many of us do not have the real love for God that we ought to have. And when we have that love for God though, we're going to love the things of God, are we not? I mean, it's just like my granddaughters, whom you know I think the world of. And I gotta tell you uh, that uh, I don't like uh, 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 trash or stuff left in my car, uh, but uh, uh, whenever the granddaughters come around, Marsha always takes my car. And she'll get stuff from my granddaughters and they'll leave it and I don't like stuff spilled on my seats or on the floor. But, but if it's my granddaughters, that's my granddaughters. Some of you can identify with that a little bit. And uh, you know, my granddaughters, uh, you love your granddaughters, they do just about anything they want to do. And uh, the only thing that grandparents, they, uh, when they're around their grandparents, or around their grandkids, and their grandkids' parents is for the parents to have to discipline the kids. We don't like that too much. We love the granddaughters. And they can do just about anything that they want to do, and I think they're beautiful and brilliant. Now, not the grandma down there, you understand. She's the disciplinarian of our family. I, I, I refer all of that stuff to her. <laughs> So the doctor thinks just a nice guy. But it is true. I bet you guys can identify with that. Uh, we love our grandkids and, and they can do, you know, pretty much anything. Hey, if they leave trash in my car, well, that's my granddaughter's. That's all right. If they spill something in my car, well, that's my granddaughter's. That's all right. Well, folks, listen, we need to have a love for lost people too, like that. And I think that greatly missing in our lives is a concern for lost people and a concern that is born because of a love for lost people. 
I think that we need to pray for God to give us a burden for the lost. I've got to tell you this, though, if we have a love for the lost like we ought to have, we're going to have a burden for the lost to come to Jesus Christ as our Savior. And so I think that in the church business, it ought to be very carefully seen, and it seems to me like I'm hearing better. No much wonder I'm not being heard. The microphone had come out of this gizmo. <laughs> I bet you can hear me now. I don't know what I'll do with this thing here exactly, but maybe I can figure out something that'll make it work. Oh, don't worry. Don't demand your money back just yet. Okay, that should fix it up. Can you hear me now? I think, folks, that the business we ought to have church for and the business of our going to church and the business of our putting our time and our tithes and our talents into the church ought to be, at least for one reason, to try to bring people to Jesus Christ. In other words, the presence of a Bible teaching church in the community does make a difference on people coming to Christ. Now, as I've said before, I'm for personal evangelism, I'm for mass evangelism, I'm for, for giving the gospel of Christ out in the truth, and I'm for then getting out of the way and letting the Holy Spirit of God do His work. But I am for us trying to be evangelists for Jesus Christ. And along those lines, I think that every child of God, every true child of God, needs to have some scriptures memorized whereby they can give somebody the place plan of salvation. So I want to ask you the question. You don't have to raise your hands or shake your heads or anything else. But I ask the question, can you give the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost person in order to bring them to the point of where they see the need of accepting Jesus Christ into their heart as their Lord and Savior? Do you have some scriptures down? I'd like to give you a few scriptures tonight and then I'll give you a short uh, plan and doing so. Uh, please, you might want to write these scriptures down. Of course, there's the Roman road to salvation, which is very uh, famous and very good. And uh, quite simply, the first verse that one would use would perhaps be Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I mean, you got to get a person lost before they're going to see their need of getting saved, right? That's the way it looks to me anyway. A person is going to have to see their need of Jesus Christ. I tell you what, folks, in all reality, down deep on the inside of every one of us, we know we're sinners, and that leads to our knowing we have a need of a Savior. But by bringing the Word of God out, that Word that is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, we can better get the idea across and I believe that the Holy Spirit of God uses the Word of God. It's not our oratory. It's not our grand personalities. It's not our good looks. It's not our uh, greatness or who we are that's going to get the job done, but it's going to be the Holy Spirit of God convicting hearts by using of the Word of God that gets the job done. I believe that. And in using the 323 of Romans, in fact, you can use from verse 10 through verse 23 on that, that you know, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that seeketh after God and so on and so forth. And then coming down to the uh, 23rd verse, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then Romans 6, 23 is kind of a second logical step. For the wages of sin is death. That's the sum total of death. The first death and the second death. As I've said before, the first death is separation of the conscious existence from the body. The second death is the separation of the conscious existence from God Almighty, right? I mean, hey, that's death in hell for all eternity. See Revelation chapter number 19 there, and chapter number 20. It is important for us to understand that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. Fortunately, the verse goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Mind you, you can explain to a person that it's a gift. It's not something they earn. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And as is often said, we would. 
given half a chance, man will allow his pride to come to the forefront and he will boast. But salvation is in Jesus Christ. It is the gift of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now how can it be a gift? Is it because God just says, oh well that's alright, we'll just sweep your sin under the rug and, and that's okay? No. How can it be the gift? It can be the gift because Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. And that kind of comes out, of course, in Romans 5, 8. 6 through 8, actually. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet sinners, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Which leads me kind of automatically into Romans 10, 9 and 10, and verse 13. 10, 9 and 10 speaks along the veins that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And verse number 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I often try to point out to people uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord as a substitute for us. He paid the penalty for us. God didn't just sweep sin out of the way. God just doesn't say, okay, we'll just overlook that. The sin had to be paid for. My sin, your sin, anybody's sin. Jesus Christ shed his blood for our sin. And if we'll take him into our heart as our Savior, we can be saved through him. Now that's a short and simple thing, but it at least gets you started. Now let me encourage you to memorize those verses. I mean, come on, folks. Uh, even kids, young kids, can memorize those verses. And I know what the older people are going to say. They're going to, because I'm an older person now. I know what they're going to say. They're going to say, well, it's easier for the young minds to memorize than me. Yeah, old guys can memorize stuff too from the Bible, right? Try it. You'll like it. And it's good to memorize it. Now it's also good to have it with you and let them see it in print. I believe in that. But man, have the scriptures down where you can logically articulate the gospel of Jesus Christ to somebody. Don't raise your hand. Don't look at anybody. Don't blink an eye or bat an eye, however you want to put it. But when's the last time you talked to somebody about their soul? You know, a lot of times we'll go days, which turn into weeks, which turn into months, which turn into years, and never have an interest in whether or not a person comes to Jesus Christ as Savior. Man, there are people all around us that need the Lord. Friends, relatives, workers at the workplace, people you see at the store, out on visitation at the church meeting and so on. It is important for God's people, I think, to at least have a burden. Now listen to me. Uh, please, if you would, you're not going to save anybody. And I'll go further than that. I've got to be careful when I say this. And I've said it before, so I'll go ahead and say it again. You're not going to lead anybody to Christ. I know that pops a lot of bubbles and busts a lot of balloons. And I know it's burst, but bust gets the idea across a little. But you and I are just the the water boys, so to speak. We're, we're just carrying the bucket. We are just the vessel. And we're not going to be a vessel usable for God unless we purge ourselves of these things and become a vessel sanctified and meet for the Master's use. Well, now let me say this. When you purge yourself and empty the vessel of the bad stuff, you need to put the good stuff in it so as you can be used of God. And if you'll memorize those verses and get them down, you don't know when the time might come up where you're in an airport somewhere or, or perhaps at a taxi stand, a bus stand, or whatever the case may be. Uh, Janet was telling me about a bus she was on, caught on fire, and they had, they had to get the bus stopped and get everybody off of the bus. Man, that would have been a great opportunity to tell people about going to hell, wouldn't it? I mean, not going to hell. 
<laughs> that would be a better way to put it. But listen, folks, I tell you, I am concerned uh, that here at Trinity we try to train everybody to be able to tell anybody how to come to Jesus Christ as their Savior. Now, i, I got to tell you this. I've read a lot of books on winning people to Christ. I've re I read a lot of books on the plan of salvation. And believe you me, the, top, the person you're going to talk to hadn't read the same book. And he doesn't know he's supposed to say this when you say that. Now you might take the book with you and say, here, <laughs> let me prime you a little bit on your answers. That's why you're going to have to be in tune with the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, we must try to stay close to the Lord and listen to that still, small voice and have all the Scripture in us that we can so that the Holy Spirit of God can call it to our attention when we need it and be a vessel, vessel usable unto the Master's work of leading people to Christ. Or, or at least trying to present the gospel. Maybe that's a better way to put it. That's about all we can do is present the gospel because the Holy Spirit of God is the one who has to convict the soul. Amen. Well, there's the Roman road. Now, I, I gave you those verses. I hope you'll memorize them. I can't memorize them for you. You've got to memorize them yourself. You've got to put something to it. And just not here at church, but day by day in your private devotional lives and so on. But those verses are some that you can use. Now, uh, I got this one from C.S. Lovett out in California. Uh, he tried to use four verses to try to lead a person to Christ. He said, keep it simple. And I agree with that, indeed. And yet I'm going to say this. I believe that there are a lot of questions out there. And we're dealing with a country now that, that brothers and sisters, has just about become a heathen country. I hate to say that about our country, but, but I'm afraid that's just about what the case is. And we're dealing with situations now where people don't know the gospel like they used to know it. And they're going to have a lot of questions. And you're going to have, a, have to have a lot of verses handy. Don't let that intimidate you. Don't let that keep you from being the witness you can be. If a person asks you a question and you can't answer it, uh, say, um, I don't know. But I'll look it up and bring you the answer and make a time when you can go back and talk to them. <laughs> I read one book on that subject and the guy said, go ask your pastor. He knows the answer to every question. <laughs> well, this is one pastor you're liable to get a... I don't know the answer, but I'll go look it up and I'll get back with you on it. I believe it is important for us, though, to have as many scriptures down as we can. Now, this one from C.S. Lovett, he said, keep it simple. And yes, there is a simplicity that is beautiful in Jesus Christ that we need. I'll give you these four verses as a plan to come into Christ. He said, first of all, you need Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, that's indispensable, indispensable, folks. And you can get a kind of grouping of scriptures together on that man is a sinner. In fact, I gave you one last Sunday night in the message. Does anybody remember the message from Sunday night? I realize you've slept since then and it's been three days and so on, but does anybody remember the message from Sunday night? Isaiah 64, 6. What does Isaiah 64, 6 have to say? Man, it's one you ought to have down. It's in that area of we're all sinners. For we're all as an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. That's what kind of a sinner we are. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, brothers and sisters. And I'll tell you, when the Holy Spirit of God comes to convict the heart, and you're convicted of sin, that's just about the way you feel. No good, absolutely undone, deserving of the judgment of God. But praise the Lord, you don't have to stop there. I'm just giving the scripture. We are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Oh, that is so true. Well, C.S. Lovett says, just use Romans 6.23, like or 3.23. I like for people to have a whole bunch of scriptures handy, but these will get you started off anyway. And then Lovett said, go to 6.23 of Romans, and I've already given you that one, for the wages of sin is death. You know, people need to know the penalty of their sin. Amen. The wages of sin is death. 
By the way, I, I even like Romans chapter number 5 on that. The entire chapter number 5 of Romans I think is wonderful. Uh, where the Bible says, For until the law, sin was in the world, uh, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who was the figure of him that was to come. Uh, we need to know, folks, that the wages of sin is death. And that death is the sum total of death, as I've already put it. And then uh, uh, C.S. Lovett said, Take the person from there to John 1, 11, and 12. He came into his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And I don't like to stop there personally. I like to go on into verse number 13, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Because you get into the ideas of the new birth, and you need to learn to present the way of salvation from several different avenues. And the new birth, or being born again, is a great one to do it. Especially because of John chapter number 3, verses 1. 1 through 18, in case you're interested. That would be a great passage to learn. That's John 3, 1 through 18. Now you already know John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You already know that one. Learn the other 17 verses in that section and you'll be able to better present it. And then if you memorize John chapter number 1, you can put the new birth together. We have to be born into God's family. Well, again, C.S. Lovett said, As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And he associated that belief with what the last part of Romans 6.23 said, The gift of God is eternal life. The gift of God is eternal life. And it's through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's not through the church. It's not through the baptismal waters. It's not through doing good works. Even though I'm for all that stuff, aren't you guys? I hope you're for going to church and being a part of church. I hope you're for baptism, uh, scriptural baptism. I hope you're for doing good works. We ought to. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We ought to be of that vein, no doubt about it, from Matthew chapter number 5. But the only way a person can be saved is through Jesus Christ our Lord. And uh, then he said they're quite necessarily going to be asking the question, well, how do I receive Christ as my Savior? And he cites then one of my favorite verses, and what is that? You guys probably already know it too. I've quoted it so many times. Revelation 3.20. Right? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. Now, I know a lot of people say, well, now, Brother Burkholder, don't you know uh, hermeneutics? Don't you know that by way of interpretation that means the church door? Uh, no, I really don't. Amen. And I'll tell you why. Because it says, if any man hear my voice and open the door. I don't know about you guys, but when I got saved as a little kid, it was just like the Lord Jesus knocking at my little heart's door. And I knew I needed to get saved. And I knew I needed to, do, to ask the Lord Jesus to come into my heart and to be my Savior. I knew it. And uh, there's something about us. I don't know what's wrong with us <laughs> altogether. Uh, I know some things that are wrong, but not all of them. But pride is even in a little kid. And uh, for a long time I wouldn't do it. But I finally realized it seemed like the Lord was knocking louder and louder and louder on my heart's door. Or as one might say, I was more and more and more under conviction. And finally, man, I had to get on my knees. Uh, it's not getting on your knees that saves you, by the way, but I happened to get on my knees down at that old chair in my uh, brother Keith's uh, uh, living room. And I asked Jesus to come into my heart and to be my Savior. And somebody says, uh, well, Brother Burkholder, you were just a little kid. You didn't know what you were doing. Uh, let me tell you something. Uh, most adults don't know what they're doing either. <laughs> I mean, come on. Who knows all that they're doing when they're giving their heart to Jesus Christ? 
We're not even scratching the surface there in that subject, if you want my personal opinion. But I believe it's important for us to get that 320 of Revelation through. And just those four scriptures, according to uh, C.S. Lovett, 323 and 623 of Romans, uh, John 1, 11 and 12, and Romans 320, or pardon me, Revelation 320. Now, there's a lot of other areas to cover, but that'll get you started. We need to get a start. Kind of like cranking an old uh, car. Anybody here ever crank an old car to start it? Anybody here ever seen a car crank to, to start it? I'm old enough uh, to remember cars coming by my dad's house up there in Denver uh, when he was preaching. I'm old enough to remember him getting out there in the front. What was it? Model A's or Model T's? I can't remember what those things were. Some kind of old car. Anyway, they'd get out there and they That's the way preachers feel with trying to get Christians started a lot of time. <laughs> amen, brothers and sisters? Can't you give me a good amen on that one? I got to tell you, it's hard to get... And sometimes we Christians get, we preachers get to the point where we feel, oh, just leave your all off of it. One of the hardest things for us to do is to get started, right? We need to carry a spiritual crank around. Of course, most, a lot of people I know are spiritual cranks. <laughs> I got to be nice, don't I? <laughs> but we need to get started. At least, folks, try to be a witness for Jesus Christ. There are people all around you who need you as a witness. And I give you those verses. Uh, oh, man, it's 8 o'clock already. Uh, time goes by very quickly. But uh, let me give you this real quick. I want to give you this in your, your witnessing program. And these are just ideas. You've got you've to do it yourself. You, you can't write down, Brother Burkholder says to say this now, and, and the person will say that. You can't write down, Brother Burkholder says to do this now. You've got you to have it down to where the Holy Spirit of God says to do this now. Amen. And no matter what the person says... I'll give you this, I've given it before, but it, it is a way of getting started. One man said that there are three good questions you can ask a person to try to get into the business of, of whether or not they're uh, really saved. And he says... Uh, uh, the first one is ask a person if they're a Christian. And he says no matter what they give as an answer to that question, you can go to the second question. And the second question is, have you ever thought of becoming a Christian? Now, if you stop to think about it, that's a leading question. That presupposes a person is not automatically a Christian. That they have to do something in order to get saved. Have you ever thought of becoming a Christian? And he says, no matter what they say, you can go to the third question. And that is, if someone were to ask you what a person has to do to become a Christian, what would you tell them? Now, I, re I realize I've given those questions, excuse me, very swiftly. But it, it'll... It, It'll help overcome that, what to me seems to be a great invisible wall into getting into the subject of talking to somebody about their soul. And I believe, folks, that, that probably if there's a, a fault in our Christianity today, it's, it's being concerned for the lost. And for those who are concerned about the loss, one of the biggest barriers is getting into it. And those three questions, if nothing else, will begin to get you into it. Have you ever thought about becoming a Christian? If someone were to ask you how to become a Christian, what would you say to them? 
And he says, no matter what they say, he said, they might say, well, live good. You can say, yes, a person ought to live good, but, but how does one become a Christian? You can get around to it eventually until you get to those points of using verses to show that we become a Christian how? By receiving Jesus Christ in our hearts as our Savior. By the new birth. Now I realize there are a lot of verses that can go along with that, but it's important for us to at least have something handy. I mean, folks, at least have something down whereby you can tell somebody how to be saved. I mean, your schoolmates, your uh, people that you, that you play with, your neighbors, other people around you. Isn't it right that we have some way of talking to people about the Lord? And you might say, well, I'm afraid I'll mess it up. Well, you probably will. But that's why we all need to be thankful that it's not us who does the saving, it's Jesus Christ. We're just the water boy. We're just the ones carrying the message. And I want to encourage you, start determining, or determine to start memorizing some scriptures to be able to tell a person how to get saved. You know, it's easy to talk about the weather. It's easy to talk about sports. It's easy to talk about the government. It's easy to talk about the economy. But it's that getting into talking about Jesus Christ that is so often, many times, a kind of barrier to us. I want to encourage you. Get some verses memorized. Get them under your belt. Get them down to where you know them backwards and forwards. And determine that you're going to try to be used of God. Make yourself available, that is to say, to be used of God. So that you can try to tell somebody how to be saved. I gave you those three questions a minute ago. I want to give a fourth question now, if I may, and I'll close this out. If someone were to ask you how to get saved, what would you tell them? Now that's a fair question, isn't it? Now, I'm not one of those who believe everybody's out there lining up just to try to get saved. I think the opposite is the truth. But the question I give out, trying to show us the importance of our at least being able to tell somebody how to get saved. May God bless you to do that. And uh, uh, that's all right. I understand my time's up. <laughs> okay, uh, Marvin. Point. A lot of times people try to get you to chase a red herring they call it like, where did uh, Cain's uh, uh, wife come from? You know, when went, you know, things like that to get you off the subject. Say, well, let me let me cover this with you first and start with. Almost 323 and go through it. Well, if you, uh, to me, um, we have to keep our, our mind on the subject at hand. And to me, it is good for us to be able to keep our own mind on the subject at hand with having enough under our belt, so to speak, to be able to tell people about Jesus Christ as Savior. You know, the gospel is simple, and yet it is profound. It is simple, and yet it can't be comprehended apart from the Holy Spirit of God. So let us do our part. And part of our part is understanding that we carry the message, but God does the work on the soul. And uh, oh, uh, I'll also say this, some plant, some water, but God giveth the increase. Never forget that one. Okay, with that then, let's make our prayer requests and uh, we'll go to the Lord for a few moments of prayer. Does anyone have a spoken request they'd like to make? Please speak up, if you would, because it's hard for me to hear up here. Marsha has to be my ears sometimes. Grace. Very well. Sure will. Anyone else? Marsha. That Brooke uh, Seahawks. Oh, yes. A uh, minister called me from Greeley, Colorado about a lady who had visited down to Austin. 
and uh, she found she began to feel real bad while she was here and went to the doctor. In short, she found out that she has uh, cancer, and they put her in the hospital down here at Austin. Uh, we've been able to visit her twice. I visited her along with Marcia last Thursday, and then Marcia visited her again Monday. And uh, she seems very appreciative. She has a friend she works with up in Colorado that's very concerned about her soul. And I wish that uh, I invite you to pray for this lady named Brooke Silos, uh, that the Holy Spirit might, might make plain to her the gospel, and that if she's not genuinely saved, she will come to Jesus Christ as her Savior. Uh, it's really quite.